Good evening and welcome to tonight's Bible study with the Lombard Church of the Nazarene. We're so glad that you joined us tonight. We're going to be talking about Monday, Thursday. We're in the season of Lent and we've been talking about Lent for the last few weeks and be talking about it for the next couple weeks. The season of Lent means lengthened. The days are lengthening now, but it's the season leading up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died for us and rose from the dead. It's a 40-day season, Lent, not including Sundays. Uh, 40 days reminding us of the time that Jesus spent in the wilderness. It's a time of testing, a time of fasting for many people, a time of giving things up, a time of growing closer to God, maybe sharpening your spiritual disciplines and focusing more on in intentional times with God. The season of Lent, it's a wonderful time of the year. And we're so glad that you joined us for this time of the year. As I said, we're talking about Maundy Thursday tonight. Uh, just as a quick review, we talked about some of the different uh, days within Lent. Uh, Fat Tuesday, the day before Lent begins, a time when sometimes people splurge and eat things that they're going to fast during the season of Lent. Uh, we have Ash Wednesday, which is the Wednesday that begins the Lenten season. It's called Ash Wednesday because sometimes, um, in some traditions, people put ashes on their forehead to begin the season. Last time we talked about Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, the last um, week in the season. Uh, it's going from Sunday to Sunday, from Palm Sunday, which is the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, uh, going all the way through the time of Jesus with the Last Supper, and Jesus being arrested, put on trial, crucified, dies, and by that next Sunday, raises from the dead, Resurrection Sunday. And so we're talking about these different things, and we're kind of right in the middle here, talking about Maundy Thursday tonight. All right, when we talk about Maundy Thursday, a lot of people think of three main parts of the, the story that happens that day. Washing Jesus, uh, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, the Last Supper, and prayer in the garden. And so I'd like us to just pause for a few moments tonight and think about these three events that took place um, during this week of Holy Week leading up to the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so um, first I'm going to begin, we call it Monday Thursday because we go by a calendar that marks days from midnight to midnight. And uh, so pretty much what we consider a day is uh, from morning until evening. Uh, but Jewish days are not like that. It's not like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They Their days are a little bit different. And their calendar day begins in the evening at sunset, usually around seven, and goes until sunset the next evening, sunset. And so when we say something happened on a certain day in the Bible, it might cross over into more than one of our human days, or I'm sorry, our American days. And so we have to understand that as we talk about these things that are happening. Monday Thursday is a day that we celebrate, or day that we remember the washing of Jesus, uh, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, the Last Supper, or prayer in the garden. Um, but we won't, we have to get out of our mind that it happened from d that whole day block from morning until evening. No, uh, some things would have begun the night before, which is hard for us to understand. But we're going to be talking about this time when Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples, and he begins by washing their feet. We read in John 13, verse 5, After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Here we see Jesus becoming this, or illustrating what it means to be a humble servant. And that's who Jesus was. Jesus is God. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, he could have people bowing down before him and doing everything for him. Instead, he decided to serve. Washing of the feet was something that was customary when somebody had guests over to their house. They, If they had a servant, they would have the servant do it. If not, the head of the household would come and wash the guest's feet. Now, we didn't have shoes like quite like we have today and and people walked wherever they went they didn't have cars and so people's feet got dirty and stinky and uh just kind of gross and so uh, often their feet would be washed before they reclined around a table especially 
Um, they didn't have chairs or use chairs like we do today. They reclined on the floor next to one another. And so their feet were right there, right? And so washing the feet, not necessarily a job that you and I would choose to do, but it's something that Jesus did for his disciples. He was illustrating this humbleness of heart, this servanthood of Jesus becoming the servant within that room. Jesus, out of everybody in that room, obviously Jesus is the Lord, but he became the servant. He became the lowest person in that room and went around and washed all of these guys' feet before this last supper. He was demonstrating love. As we think about Maundy Thursday, and again, it's not just a day, but it's a day we set aside to remember the things that happened there. Let's be reminded of love. This whole day and the things that we think about with this day of the washing of the feet and the Last Supper and Jesus praying in the garden, it's all about love. It's about what Jesus is about to do and Jesus is doing for not only his disciples, but for mankind. It's all about love. Peter stops Jesus and says, no, 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 don't. This is wrong. You're the Messiah. You're the Lord. I should be washing your feet. And we read here in John 13, 8, he says, no, uh, no, said Peter, you shall not never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So the washing of the feet has some spiritual significance. Not only was Jesus being a servant and humble and being hosp hospitable and going down and doing the work that probably nobody else in that room really wanted to do, which is an example to us, but Peter's like, no, 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 no. And Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And he's illustrating a point here that there needs to be a washing, a cleansing that happens in order for us to be a part of Jesus. The washing of their feet meant more than just washing their stinky feet. Jesus was illustrating that everybody in that room needed to be washed and illustrated that Jesus is the one that could wash them. Okay, he's washing their feet, but you can see here how he's talking about being washed in our soul, being washed in our heart, being cleansed within. It's symbolizing salvation and cleansing. And Peter's like, okay, if that's the case, Lord, of me being with you, then wash all of me. Wash my head, right? Not just my feet. He wanted to be cleansed by Jesus. And Jesus is illustrating this to them, that um, there needs to be a cleansing that happens. This this day, as we remember the, on Monday, Thursday, this time to set aside, thinking about Jesus and about love, think about the love he had for those disciples. And thinking about the love that he has for us, he doesn't want to just wash our feet. He wants to save us. He wants to wash all of us and cleanse us and make us pure. A little bit later on in John 13, 15, he says, Jesus says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus is now saying, see how I'm acting with you. See how we're interacting. When you come in, I'm treating you with respect. I'm getting down and I'm washing your feet and I'm loving you. And, and he goes, this is how I want you to live. I, I'm doing this also as an example. I'm literally washing your feet because they need to be washed. <laughs> Two, I'm doing this to show you that we all need a cleansing. But three, I'm doing it as an example so that you go out and do the same thing. We need to go out and live humble lives. We need to be humble servants and serve other people. Do things that necessarily other people wouldn't do. I always say I wouldn't ask anybody to do something that I'm not willing to do. Um, there are jobs that are not luxurious but need to get done and and we all sometimes need to roll up our sleeves and, and do some of that. But Jesus is illustrating this, these acts of love to the disciples and said, now you go and do like me. And our service of love should lead to this cleansing of salvation in other souls. Our goal is to love people because God told us to love them. Jesus ex gave us the example to love them. And, and pray that they would receive a total cleansing from Jesus, just like we have. It's supposed to be a multiplicative process. Now, well, let's pause here. You might be thinking, well, why, why this word Mondi Thursday? We don't really use that term in our everyday life. What does it mean? 
It's a shortened form of a, a longer Latin word, which means command. You may be thinking, so why do we call the Thursday or whatever this day would be that it happened uh, before Jesus' crucifixion, why, why do we call it Mondi? Why do we call it Command Day? <laughs> you know, when we think of this Mondi Day, we think of, hold on, washing feet, we think of a meal, right? What, why command? Why do we think of this day as command day? It's because, and a lot of times it's overlooking, uh, overlooked, I'm sorry, that Jesus gave a command this day to his disciples. He calls it a new command. In John 13, 34, he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. You might say, this doesn't sound like a, a new commandment. We know we're supposed to love. Well, in the Old Testament, there were lots of laws, right? And we know the commandments, and we know especially the Ten Commandments, right? Do you have them memorized? We should be able to say those, right? But deeper than that, we have other commandments. And in the New Testament, Jesus asked, what are the greatest commandments? And they said, love God and, and to love our neighbors, right? And so we're supposed to love our neighbors. But Jesus is setting this as a commandment for his disciples and for us moving forward. It's this new commandment. It's to love one another. But he explains it. Uh, he puts a, a, a tag here at the end. He says, but I want you to love as I have loved you. And so he's saying, I don't want you to love the way the world loves. Because there are lots of definitions of what it means to love. And a, people, a lot of people can be abusive and say, but I love you. Or they can hurt you and say, I love you. Or they can be mean to you and say, I love you. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not love. We don't love as the world says it's okay to love. Or we don't love according to a definition in a, a dictionary. We love the way Jesus loves. We love how we experience love from Jesus. A love that forgives. A love that understands. A love that is patient. A love that is kind. A love that is peacemaking. We are commanded to love that way and when Jesus is with his disciples and they have this time together he says I give you this new commandment that's why this day has been labeled in the past as Mondi command command day because we are called as God's people to love love as he has loved not love as the world has loved but love as Jesus has loved all right so another part of this Mondi or command day this day of love is what we know as communion or we, where we get communion from last supper the lord's supper the passover meal people talk about this and there are actually multiple meals that are a part of the celebration we're not going to get into it tonight but i i'd love to get into a, a conversation soon about the the really the breakdown of these days leading up and and the actual activities that happen leading up to and including the Passover time. But this, this time is a remembering of how God delivered the firstborns of Israel, even though the firstborns of Egypt died and how God led them out of deliverance of slavery. But God remembered the firstborns. It's an image of love. It's an image of Jesus as our lamb. It's an image of him being sacrificed. And so Jesus is there, and where we get our last, our, our communion from, from this, our sacrament, is Jesus says, this, this bread is my body, this drink is my blood, I'm giving my life for you, is basically what he is saying, out of an act of love for you, I'm going to be the sacrifice for you, I'm going to be the firstborn of God to lay down my life so that you could live. Because the firstborns of Egypt had to die in order for the Israelites to be set free. Jesus had to send his son, I'm sorry, God had to send his son Jesus to die, his firstborn, so that we could live today. Wow. An act of love. And that's what we're remembering. And so this day, is, there's a command about love, right? Uh, Jesus gets down on his hands and feet and washes the disciples' feet out of love, out of, out of an example of love. Then he says, I'm going, I'm, my body is this bread and my blood is this wine, broken and poured out for you. I'm going to do this 
and we eat this in remembrance of him out of the love that he has for us. Do you see how this day is all about love and this command to love as Jesus has loved? After this time together, they make their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, a garden where Jesus goes and he tells the disciples, I want you to pray. I want you to watch and pray with me. And then he tells three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, come on, come pray with me. And then after a while, he pulls a little away from them. But if you know the story, they keep falling asleep. And he goes and wakes them up and tells them, wake up, wake up. But uh, the disciples keep falling asleep they're not able to watch and pray as they are called to and we read here in Matthew 26 39 and going a little farther he fell on his face and this is what Jesus prayed my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as I will but as you will in other words Jesus knew what was coming he knew that he was going to be the is the body and the blood of the sacrifice that was needed for the deliverance of the people. And he's saying, God, if there was another way to do this, you know, I'd love to take it. But nevertheless, it's not about my will. It's about your will. And Father, this is what you want. I'm willing. Lord, I, it, this is going to be hard. In my humanness, is going to be hard. But I'm going to be obedient. And he's saying this, this cup that's going to be poured out on him, some call it the cup of sacrifice or suffering that he's going to have to go through. See, remember, Jesus is all man and all God put together. So his humanness, of course, wants to avoid suffering. Isn't that what we do in our humanness? We don't like suffering. So sometimes we avoid suffering. We avoid persecution. We avoid pain. We avoid confrontation at all costs, right? That's a human nature thing. But Jesus knew that his suffering would lead to victory. His suffering would lead to mankind being able to be saved. And so he's teaching us that suffering can lead to victory. And Jesus faced it head on. And he took it in the humanness of him, knowing that he would suffer and pain and be abandoned and die. He said, okay. Yes, Lord. Why? Why? because of love. This is all about love. This this Mondi time leading up to the crucifixion and, and burial of Jesus and then the resurrection is a time for us to remember the command to love as he has loved. And it's a day to remember the things that he did for us out of love. And it's meant to inspire us to love. It says in Matthew 26, 41, Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's telling them to watch. Not just watch for God, but watch for the enemy. Watch for temptation and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. He's telling us to be conscious of what we're doing. Not reacting to what is happening, but watch and be aware of what is happening so that you can pray and be delivered through the temptation so that we would not fall into temptation. We need to be aware of what's happening and we need to be praying about what's happening in our lives. And Jesus is teaching that. The disciples were falling asleep and not watching and not praying. And that's when the enemy was coming and at work. He's reminding us to watch. In the time that we live in, look around, watch. Know what's going on around us and pray. Be aware that the enemy is looking to bring us down. The enemy is looking to steal, kill, and destroy, but God has come to bring life. Amen? And to bring it abundantly. And we praise God for that. He wants to bring us through. Our spirit is weak. I mean, I'm sorry, our flesh is weak. <laughs> but our spirit is willing, right? We say, yeah, we want to be where God wants us to be. We want to do what God wants us to do, but our flesh uh, gets weak. Our flesh... Um, wants to do things that are easy, avoid certain things, and run towards other things that we shouldn't. So we have to be aware. We have to watch and pray. Then Jesus said in Matthew 26, 46, Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus rose up, even though he prayed, Lord, if it's your will, I mean, uh, to take this cup from me, so be it. But if not, your will be done. And when the time came, he stood up. He rose 
Uh, and so let's go. We're going to face what God has for him. Jesus embraced being our sacrifice. That's love. And he's telling us to rise up and face what God has for us. Through the suffering comes great victory. And we're called to love like Jesus loved and was willing to give up his life for us. That's what this Mandi or Command Day is all about. We're going to take a moment to pray, and as we do, I'm going to encourage you to reach out to us if you have something you'd like us to pray about. There is uh, an email, prayer at lumbarchurch.org. The Church of the Nazarene in the United States and Canada is having a half million mobilization trying to call 500,000 people to pray, to pray for our denomination, to pray for our local churches, to pray for God's direction and guidance within each of us, his people. Amen. So in April, in just a couple weeks, uh, our church board is going to be setting aside a time to be praying together. And we're going to be praying for the church. We're going to be praying for individuals. We're going to be praying for you if you'd like us to. And so in, in the next week, if uh, between now and next Wednesday, I'm going to encourage you, email us at prayer at lumbarchurch.org if you have something we can pray for you specifically about. And we as a church board will pray. And we promise you, we will pray and lift you up. We're not going to go around sharing it with everybody. We're just going to pray for whatever those requests are and keep it to ourselves. Well, not just to ourselves. We're going to share them with God. We're going to lift you up in prayer. We're so excited about that. So we encourage you, email us again at prayer at lombardchurch.org. Let's pray right now. Lord God, we just want to thank you and praise you for you are good. You're an awesome God and worthy to be praised. We invite you to come right now. Speak to us. Speak into our lives this commandment of love. Not into our ears, but into our hearts, into our minds, into our being. Help us to love like you love us. Give us that unconditional love. Lord, the things that we read about leading up to your crucifixion and and death and, and burial and then resurrection all point to love. You did it out of love for us. Teach us, Lord, to have that kind of love. Not just teach us, give us that love because you are love. Come in us, Holy Spirit, and fill us to the fullest with your presence. Overflow us with love. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We thank you again for joining us tonight. And remember, God loves you. And so do we.